Hello and welcome to our Bible class. We appreciate you tuning in this afternoon and being with us as we study the book of Numbers. We appreciate those of you who always are with us in this Bible class and we really appreciate that. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we have once again to come together and study your word. We pray that as we do so, that you will open our hearts, that we might strive to serve you faithfully. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We are in Numbers 25, beginning at the first verse. We have gotten through the very unusual incident of Balaam, uh, Balaam and Balak. Balaam trying to curse Israel, but not being allowed to by God. We saw how that all played out. Uh, throughout Numbers chapter 24. In Numbers 25, 1 beginning, we find what the Israelites were doing while Israel remained at Shittim. Verse 1, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Notice that. Shittim is 10 miles east of Jericho. They are very much on the border, right on the verge of going into Canaan. And now they are playing the harlot. This is a definitive choice. This is not happening by accident. They're playing the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now, how were they playing the harlot? Obviously, there was sexual immorality involved. But there was something else. Verse 2, For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Notice this. They were having fellowship. They were having fellowship with idols. They were having fellowship with this idolatrous practices. And it goes on further in verse 3 to, uh, to describe this. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. Baal of Peor. Baal was the foremost Canaanite deity. You're going to see Baal's name come up over and over again throughout the Old Testament. And he was worshipped in numerous places as a local deity. So sometimes you'll see the plural term Balaam used, B-A-A-L-I-M. And also it can be rendered Baals as it is in Judges 2.11. Baal of Peor in this instance would have been the local fertility god. And the worship involved not only sacrificial feasts, but also lewd practices as religious prostitution. And those that were devoted to that dramatically enacted Baal's mating with his goddess consort. In other words, we're talking about debauchery. And the Israelites were joining themselves to it. Now, later on in chapter 31, we're going to see how that Balaam that we've just seen in chapter 24, Balaam uh, conspired to get Israel to do this. In fact, you come over to Numbers 31, 16. We jump ahead just a little bit. And it says, Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So Balaam gave counsel. He was giving advice and consent to the Moabites as to how to entice Israel to commit sin. So Balaam's work was not done at the end of chapter 24. When you saw that Balaam arose and departed and went to a, and returned to his place, he didn't go home. What he did is he went straight to the Moabites and he counseled them to entice Israel to sin, which they did. Then it says the Lord was angry against Israel. That word angry is, doesn't really capture the depth and the fervor of the anger that the Lord had against Israel at that moment. It was a white hot anger. It was something that uh, had to be recompensed. And so, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Notice this. He says, take all the leaders. Another translation renders that word chiefs, which would indicate these are the ring leaders in this idolatry that was taking place. And notice also he says, execute. 
There's several ways that that word can be rendered. It can be rendered execute, as it is here in the New American Standard Bible. It can also be rendered hang, as it is in, Revi in the Revised Standard Version. Or it could be throw down. The word itself, the Hebrew word, hoka, possibly means throw down, which would indicate that they may have been thrown down from a high place. That's a very grisly way of dying. But if you look at passages such as uh, 2 Chronicles 25, 12, that uh, is a possibility. Another possibility is impalement. Unlike hanging, it was commonly practiced in the ancient Near East. In whatever method is chosen by the Lord, it's a very public execution in broad daylight before everybody's eyes, where everybody can see it, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. The corpses possibly were to be left unburied and exposed, uh, which that would also indicate the fierce anger of the Lord. And that fierce anger was going to be manifested in what would take place next. Verse 5, So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. So the judges of Israel were to execute those ringleaders. They were to single out the ones who had led Israel into this apostasy, and they were to execute them in broad daylight. Then, verse 6, Behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel. While they were weeping, at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Now, now get this picture in your mind. Moses and all the sons of Israel are at the congregation, or the, at the doorway of the tent of meeting, the congregation, along with Moses, weeping, mourning over this situation. And apparently, Moses is struck, completely overtaken with his grief. Because watch what happens. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the, plea, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation. Now what is happening? One of the sons of Israel was bringing a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and the congregation. Now what significance is this? This is one of the women that were enticing the Israelites to sin. And this individual, this son of Israel, was flaunting it. He was flaunting this in front of Moses and in front of all the sons of Israel. And Moses is so overtaken by his grief, he's not doing anything about it. But watch what Phinehas does. He arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both, both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Notice this. Phinehas, who is the son of Eleazar, who is the son of Aaron, that is, he's Aaron's grandson, takes this sword, or this spear, that is, and impales both the man and that Midianite woman. That's gruesome when you think about it. But... It's righteous indignation that Phinehas has. Phinehas's name means the Nubian for whatever reason. But still, Phinehas's zeal was that he was going to take care of this situation if Moses wasn't going to. This is a rare case of Moses not taking lead as he normally would to try to get this situation under control. But Phinehas takes it in his hands to do it. And notice verse 9. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. 24,000 people died by the plague. So, in connection with the executions that were to take place, that is, that were to take place among the ring leaders that Moses had issued to the elders of Israel, now this plague has broken out. And in the midst of them weeping and mourning over it, Phinehas stems it by impaling this man and his Midianite woman. Now, 1 Corinthians 
the Apostle Paul is talking about the example of Israel as far as what we must not do. And he mentions 23,000 fell because of fornication. Well, there seems to be a discrepancy. 23,000 in 1 Corinthians 10, 8. 24,000 mentioned here in our text in Numbers. The possibility, the possible uh, solution to that is that the text here in Numbers may include those from verse 5. That is, the ones that Moses said for the elders of Israel to kill. So whatever way you slice it, you've got a huge number of people who are dying because of this apostasy. So verse 10, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. It was because of what Phinehas did that Israel was not completely wiped out. That plague was spreading throughout Israel. It already had gotten 23,000 people and on top of the ones that the elders of Israel had killed already, the ringleaders. And now Phinehas has checked it. And he says, verse uh, 12, Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him, a covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. He was jealous for his God. Phinehas is so much unlike his uncles, Nadab and Abihu. He is so much like Eleazar, his father, and he's like Aaron, his grandfather. So, he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Verse 14. Now the name of the slain man of Israel who was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Simeonites. Now why is he mentioning this? We're going to see why when we get to the next chapter. The name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who is head of the people of a father's household in Midian. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Be hostile to the Midianites and strike them. Another way to, the word can be translated is harass them. For they have been hostile to you with their tricks, with which they have deceived you in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. So the Lord is describing what happened, what was the, the reason for uh, this apostasy. The Midianites have been involved in it. The Midianites had conspired with the Moabites, and as we will see in chapter 31, as we read just a moment ago, Balaam had given counsel to them to do this very thing. So, they have deceived you, he says, in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Cosby. All of this is mentioned in connection of the slain man of Israel. It segues into chapter 26, and it segues into it in a very interesting way once we get there, and I'll explain when we get to that point. Chapter 26, Then it came about after the plague, that the Lord spoke to Moses and to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, from twenty years old and upward, by their, their father's households, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel. Now, we, we saw early in the book of Numbers, when they're encamped at Mount Sinai, that they took that census. Of course, a lot has happened in between that and this. Almost forty years have passed, in fact. And all of the apostasy that Israel's engaged in, and that entire generation has now died in the wilderness, and now they're ready to go into Canaan, and they have to take this census. So Moses and Eleazar the priest spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, notice where they're located. They're in the plains of Moab by the Jordan. They're on the very verge of Canaan. They're at the brink of going in. 
and they're going to take the census. Take a census of the people from 20 years old and upward, as the Lord has commanded Moses. Now the sons of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt were Reuben, Israel's firstborn. The sons of Reuben. And what we're not going to read all this in great detail. We're going to read the names, but we're not going to read all of it because it's repetitive, of course. When we get to different points in it, we will stop and, and make comment. Of Hanuk, the family of the Hanukites, Palu, the Palites, Hezron, Hezronites, Carmi, Carmites. These are the families of the Reubenites, and those who are numbered of them were 43,730. Then, verse 8, the sons of Palu, Eliab, Eliab, Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram who were called by the congregation, who contended against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah, when they contended against the Lord, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with Korah, when that company died, when the fire devoured 250 men, so that they became a warning. He's reminding us who this is. A very infamous name among the Israelites. But notice what he says in verse 11. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. What does he mean by that? What does he mean the sons of Korah did not die? That means there were descendants of Korah, that is, descendants who separated themselves from their father's judgment. Their descendants became an outstanding family in Israel. These descendants of Korah were, it was abhorrent to them what Korah had done. And they wanted to distinguish themselves from their past. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. The reason why I stop here and make these comments is because when you look back at what we saw in chapter 25 about the slain man of Israel who was, oh, Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of the father's house among the Simeonites, a name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who was head of the people of the father's household of Midian. What he's doing here is he's contrasting. He's contrasting what had happened with these individuals who had a background that they weren't proud of, but yet they had decided, they had determined they were not going to go in that direction. So, Verse 12, the sons of Simeon, according to their families, of Nemuel, of Nemuel, the family of the Nemuelites, of Jamin, the family of Jamanites, Jachin, the family of Jachinites, Zira, Zerahites, Shal, Shalites, the family of the Simeonites, 22,200. Notice, far less than the number we had mentioned earlier. Perhaps it really decimated them more than most. That is, this apostasy. The sons of Gad, verse 15. Zephon, Zephonites, Haggai, Haggites, Shunai, Shunites, Osni, Osnites, Eri, Erites, Arad, Aradites, Aralai, Aralites. Families of the sons of Gad, number 40,500. Verse 19. The sons of Judah were Ur and Onan, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Judah, according to their families, were of Shelah, Shelites, of Perez, Perizzites, of Zerah, Zerites. The sons of Perez were of Hezron, Hezronites, Hamul, Hamalites. These are the families of Judah, according to those who are numbered, 76,500. The sons of Issachar, according to their families, of Tola, Tolites, Puva, Puvites, Jashub, Jashubites, Shimron, Shimronites. The number, 64,300. Verse 26. The sons of Zebulon, Sirid, Siridites, Elon, Elonites, Jaleel, Jaleelites, the number 60,500. Verse 28, the sons of Joseph, according to their families, Manasseh and Ephraim, the sons of Manasseh, Maker, Makerites, Maker became the father of Gilead, of Gilead, Gileadites, these are the sons of Gilead, of, Je of Yezer, the Yezerites, Helic, Helicites, Azrael, Azraelites, Shechem, Shechemites, Shemida, Shemidites, Hefer, Heferites. Now Zelophehad, verse 33, the son of Hefer, had no sons, but only daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Terzah. 
Would you like to name your daughters or granddaughters those names? These are the families of Manasseh. The number, 52,700. Verse 35, sons of Ephraim, Shudhia, Shulite, uh, Shula, Shudhelaites. Very difficult to pronounce that word. Of Beaker, Beakerites, Tan, Tanites. The sons of Shutala, of Eren, Erenites. This family of the sons of Ephraim, 32,500. These are the sons of Joseph according to their families. Verse 38, the sons of Benjamin. Bela, Belites, Ashbel, Ashbelites, Abiram, 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 uh, Shifunam, Shifunam. Say that three times fast. The family of the Shufamites, Hufam, Hufamites, Bela, Ard, and Naaman. Of Ard, the family of the Ardites, Naaman, the Naamites. These are the sons of Benjamin, the number 45,600. Sons of Dan, verse 42. Shuam, Shuamites, the families of Dan, all the families of the Shuamites, 64,400. The sons of Asher, according to their families. Imna, Imnites, Ishvai, Ishvites, Bariah, Barites, of the sons of Bariah, Heber, Heberites, Malchiel, Malchielites. The name of the daughter of Asher was Sira. These are the families of the sons of Asher, 53,400. The sons of Naphtali, Jezeel, Jezeelites, Gunai, Gunites. Jezer, Jezerites, Shilam, Shilamites, the families of Naphtali, 45,400. So, verse 51, after all those names, all those numbers, these are those who are numbered the sons of Israel, 601,730. So when you compare the number of those that were numbered at Sinai with those that are numbered here at this point, there's not a lot of difference between the two. Verse 52, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Among these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To the larger group you shall increase their inheritance, and to the smaller group you shall diminish their inheritance. Each shall be given their inheritance according to those who are numbered of them. This is going to be an equitable distribution, in other words. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. According to the names of the tribe of their fathers. So the census is being taken here, has already been taken that is, and the distribution is done by tribes, tribal representatives, an equitable basis for division of all of these. According to the selection by lot, their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and the smaller groups. These are those who are numbered the Levites according to their families. Of Gershon, the Gershonites. Of Kohath, the Kohathites. Of Merari, the Merarites. These are the families of Levi, the family of the Libnites, Hebronites, Malites, Mushites, Korahites. Kohath became the father of Amram. The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And she bore to Amram, Aaron, and Moses, and their sister Miriam. So here we finally have the names of Moses' parents given. Amram and Jochebed. All the way in the book of Numbers. He waits until this point to give, them, give their names to us. To Aaron were born Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. Notice that. He again mentions this. If you're just joining us, we're in the midst of Numbers chapter 26. We are at verse 61. So Nadab and Abihu's sin is again mentioned. It's important for us to know about it. That they offered strange fire to the Lord which he commanded not. Those who were numbered of them, that is the Levites, were 23,000. Every male from a month old and upward. For they were not numbered among the sons of Israel, since no inheritance was given to them among the sons of Israel. So the 601,730 does not include the 23,000 of Levi. So you've got a total of 624,730 when you count the Levites in. <clears throat> Verse 63. These are those who are numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, and numbered the sons of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho. But among these, 
There was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priest who numbered the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. The fate of those who had rebelled at Sinai was complete. Standing as a warning for all time and a warning for us. Verse 65, For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And not a man was left of them, except Caleb the son of Jethunah and Joshua the son of Nun. Joshua and Caleb were the only spies that brought back a good report. The other spies brought back an evil report, caused Israel to sin, caused them to die out in the wilderness. So Joshua and Caleb are going to be the only ones of that entire generation that will be allowed to enter the promised land. Not even Moses is allowed to enter. So their fate, the Israelites' fate, is a warning to us. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happen as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who think he stands take heed that he does not fall. These examples are warnings to us today as much as ever before. We need to take heed of what the Bible says. Not only do are we warned about this in 1 Corinthians 10, you turn over to Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. The Hebrews writer says, Therefore, as just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me, and saw my works for forty years. Therefore I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. And as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another to day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have the comfort takers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm unto the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. Notice this. That entire generation that fell in the wilderness, God said, you will not enter. Your bodies will perish in the wilderness. That entire generation died because of unbelief. But hold on. Didn't they see the mighty works of God in Egypt? Didn't they witness the miracles that God had done? Yes, over and over and over they did. But they didn't trust God. They did not want to obey God. And the same thing can happen to us today. Now, we don't see miracles today as they did then. We don't see miracles performed as it was performed in the first century by Jesus and the apostles. We do not see the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in a miraculous way in our day and time. But we have the Spirit-inspired Word, do we not? We have God's promises that are vouchsafed for us in his Word. Do we really believe those promises? Do we really believe his word? Or do we want things our way? 
Because that's exactly what Korah wanted to do. That's exactly what Dathan and Abiram and those leaders of the apostasy of Israel wanted to do. They wanted things their way. Nadab and Abihu wanted things their way instead of God's way. And today, my friends, when we want things our way instead of God's way, we are falling into the same trap that Israel did. We need to beware. We need to watch carefully that we don't fall into that same trap, into that same pattern of unbelief and disobedience. So we need to make sure that we have the faith of Caleb and that we have the faith of Joshua who put their trust in God no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, no matter how dire things look, God is with us who can be against us. No one can stand against us if the Lord's with us. That's the kind of faith we need in these trying times. That's the kind of faith that we need in any time, but especially today in all that we're seeing around us, all of the all of the uh, pandemic of effects that's going on and and all of the uncertainty and the questioning and the riots and all of what we're seeing play itself out in our country, we need to put our trust in God, put our trust in His Word more than ever before, and not turn away from it. Chapter 27. Then the daughters of Zolothahad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, came near. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, and Hogla, and Milka, and Terzah. They stood before Moses, and before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders, and all the congregation, at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Now notice, we've seen these names before in chapter 26, back in verse 33. Zelophehad had only daughters, and he gives the names there, the family of Manasseh. So now they're again mentioned here. Our father died in the wilderness, yet he was not among the company of those who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah. Interesting. But he died in his own sin, and he had no son. Why should the name of our father be withdrawn from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. Now notice this. They bring up the rebellion of Korah. They say, yes, our father died in the wilderness, but he was not among those who rebelled in Korah's company. That's a very interesting distinction that they're making here. They're trying to distinguish themselves from Korah. The women first clearly stated that their father had neither deserved nor received special punishment, but rather had stood in that regard on equal plane with the remainder of those who died in the wilderness. He was not singled out like, the, like those involved in the rebellion of Korah were. He simply died because of his own sin. So their father had no legally recognized heirs because he had no sons. Sons were so important to ancient Israelites that barren wives sought to provide offspring through handmaids. We've seen that play out already uh, in Genesis. And the institution of leveret marriage that we'll see in Deuteronomy 25 was designed to obtain a son for a deceased, a deceased Israelite. Such measures did not cover all cases. And so... Zelophehad had died without possibly a male heir, but he had left behind five enterprising and courageous daughters. These women wanted uh, their name, his name, that is, his family name, to continue. So, Moses brought their case before the Lord. Verse 6. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in their statements. You shall surely give them a hereditary possession among their father's brothers, and you shall transfer the inheritance of their father to them. Further, you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. 
If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his nearest relative in his own family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be a statutory ordinance to the sons of Israel, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So, this special case is brought up, and because of that, the Lord institutes this exception. That is, this circumstantial law. In the case of a man that has no sons, and all of this is described, then here's the procedure to follow. So, this is interesting. It is a very interesting thing. That these women, that these women, because of their courage and their industriousness, industriousness, had brought this situation to Moses' attention. And then the Lord takes care of it. So, verse, thir- verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, Go up to the mountain of Abarim. Abarim means regions beyond. That's in northwest Moab. And see the land which I have given to the sons of Israel. When you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother was. So in other words, when Moses sees the land, then he's going to pass away. The time is near for his passing. For in the wilderness of Zen, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to treat me as holy before their eyes at the water. These are the waters of Meribah of Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen. So this is another insight as to why Moses is not being allowed to go into the promised land. You rebelled against my command to treat me as holy before their eyes at the water. For some reason, something in Moses' mind at that moment rebelled against God. He was falling in the same trap as the Israelites who had rebelled in the wilderness. But, at any case, he's going to be able to see the land but not go in it. Verse 15, Then Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation. Here is the selflessness of Moses. He knows his day is now going to pass. Someone else needs to step up who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord will not be like sheep which have no shepherds. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Joshua has the Spirit of the Lord on him, the Holy Spirit. And have him stand before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation and commission him in their sight. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Moreover, he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his command they shall go out, and at his command they shall come in, both he and the sons of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Moses did just as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation. Then... He laid his hands on him and commissioned him, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. So now the leadership role is officially being passed. Joshua is to take up the mantle. He is to take up the role that Moses has played all this time. And now Joshua is to take command of the Israelites after Moses' passing. This is where we will stop for our lesson today. And we will take up with our Bible study next week at chapter 28 of the book of Numbers. We thank you once again for being with us. Remember the Wednesday night Bible class at 6.30. Also the worship next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock at the building. Until next time, may God richly bless you.